Welcome. Today I would like to talk about absolutely amazing chess tournament which I recently played in Italy. The tournament was a chess competition between different universities organized by the oldest university, at least in Western Europe, the University of Bologna. So the goal of the tournament was to have a friendly chess competition between prestigious universities from all over the world and the organizers managed to attract top universities such as Sorbonne, Yale, Cambridge and we took part with a team of Maastricht University. So the organizers did an absolutely amazing job in organizing this competition. Um, they organized the most amazing playing hall I've ever played in. The playing hall was the old library of Bologna with a lot of prestigious books and they even had a chess exhibition next to um, the playing, the actual play. So, um, on top of that, they organized a lot of side events like a blitz tournament, a wine tasting and many other social activities. So we really could uh, interact also with the players from the other universities. The rules were as follows. Each team was composed of four players plus potential substitutes and the four players could either be four students or three students and a professor as um, this, and this is what we did. So we played uh, in a team together uh, with um, some of our PhD students, namely Michal Buditsky, um, Paula Gitu and uh, Pedro Gonzalez. And yeah, we had an amazing team spirit as well. So it was really a memorable experience for me. Um, so yeah, let me one, time, one more time thank the organizers, in particular the main organizers and uh, the student Mattia, who did a great job in showing us around in the city and really to have, to have a really, really friendly spirit and at the same time a kind of serious competition next to it. With such competitions the risk is always that the playing field is not very level but this didn't happen either so most of the teams were like quite close in terms of playing strength. So yeah let's take a look at my first game from this tournament and this game I played with the black pieces against Cameron Go from Cambridge University. So Cameron opened the game with a move d4 and I uh, answered with the Grunfeld so I thought, okay, probably in such a competition people are not as prepared, especially in the first round, so playing the Greenfield might be a good idea, because the only downside of the Greenfield is kind of, if people see that you play this sometimes, they can prepare very special lines against it. Okay, so in the game, now I played the move c6. The alternative is, is to go either bishop g7 first or d5 immediately, but this just leads to completely different positions and my goal was in a university competition, in a team competition, to start by playing something which is more solid uh, and so I decided to play this Greenfeld line with c6 and then d5. My opponent uh, reacted by yeah, playing the standard line, castles, castles, and here we reached the um, main starting position of this line, so some people now play more quiet stuff like knight bd2 or b3. Um, also the move queen b3 is definitely an option um, and I guess I would call the main move c takes d followed by uh, something like knight e5. At least that was the main move when I was still actively going through opening theory. So my opponent surprised me with his move knight to e5 and after the game he told me that this uh, was suggested on some chessable course by some Indian Grandmaster. So um, I was already out of book and I started to think. Um, but at the time uh, I was still hoping that he might also be out of book. So I just thought, okay, I, I should go d takes c, which is logical. The knight has to move again. And then I play bishop e6, put my bishop to d5, as you often do in these lines, and I should be fine. He instantly reacted by playing knight e5, and I played bishop d5, and I thought, okay, that cannot be too bad. But here he really surprised me by playing the move which was uh, suggested in this chessable course, namely the move bishop to h3. And this is actually quite unpleasant to um, play against, especially like in the first round in a situation which is not like a classical time control, but 45 plus 10 is kind of in the middle somewhere, um, in between rapid and classical. And yeah, what's the point of this? I mean, the point of this is that my bishop on d5 is kind of stupid. So if he gets the time, he will in some way prepare e4 and eventually kick the, kick the bishop away. And then I'm like completely cramped. Um, so here I was really not so sure what to do. So the line that I was starting to look at is the line with some move like knight fd7, knight bd7. 
probably knight fd7 and then after takes takes i thought okay white goes knight c3 and i thought okay this is quite dangerous for me but actually he told me after the game that this is the main line that is given uh in the in the course and um it goes like e6 here and the point is you cannot go uh, e4 yet because of uh, bishop c4 but uh, so if you take this kind of structure i think i would take back with e takes c takes might, might also make sense this kind of structure is quite decent for black so i think there's nothing to fear so i was more afraid in my calculation of a move like b3 now with the idea of going e4 um, but then the course just gives this move f5 just to protect yeah uh, against e4 and says that this position is roughly balanced um, during the game i was really quite afraid of this position i have to say and that's why i decided to stop my calculation there so after bishop h3 i came up with a different move namely the move queen to d6 and my idea is pretty simple so i i just want to get rid of this problem bishop on d5 bring it back to e6 and then i thought how bad can this be he played uh, knight c3 bishop e6 and still pretty much uh, immediately the move bishop to g2 so yeah now it's kind of clear i mean we moved the bishops back and forth and i included this slightly awkward move queen to d6 so it, it's clear that he has won the opening battle and probably slightly better here um, that said i was also not too unhappy because i thought okay my position is a bit cramped but uh, there are still a lot of pieces on the board and against a slightly weaker player i should be probably able to outplay him at a later point in the game so i went with the move rook to d8 so the computer gives something like knight bd7 as well but i was a bit afraid of f oh knight bd7 f4 and it was not so clear to me how i unpack so instead i went with rook d8 and uh, here he played the move e3 and probably this is already the point at which at least he gives away the advantage so probably the play the way to play for the advantage here is to move the knight back to f3 protect the pawn on d4 and either go a3 first or maybe even with a sort of sacrifice bishop f4 and then a3 and my pieces are still uh, somewhat cramped so the point of this knight f3 is of course that it's very very difficult now for me to exchange pieces like knight bd7 and these kind of things run into into nothing and he is slightly ahead in terms of space so in, for this reason he should avoid um, exchanging pieces all right so he played the move e3 protecting d4 which i mean at least now this bishop is uh, behind the pawn chain which definitely is, is a worse version of uh, the, the position he could have gotten with knight to f3 so yeah i thought okay the bishop will, t will have to deal yeah, so he will have to deal with the bishop for a few uh, moments so i have the time to be a bit slower to play knight queen c7 knight d7 and then uh, things should be fine Played queen c2 that's also logical knight bd7 attacking um this knight on e5 yeah and here he basically now decided not to exchange pieces which is probably correct but i think he should have gone f4 to do that um, because i don't really want to take on e5 so this kind of structure at least in the game i thought white should be somewhat better here um, so after f4 i would probably play a bit slower like rook ac8 or something like this so instead of this after knight bd7 my opponent decided to go back with a knight to d3 which is in some way logical um, but the problem here is that he allows me to exchange my worst piece namely this bishop on e6 so this bishop in all of the lines that we have seen so far was always the problem piece and now i'm able to get rid of the piece by playing uh, bishop to c4, uh, c4 potentially taking here uh, if the bishop gets kicked and um, yeah still i don't really have to give up the bishop pair but now i, I can see a way how black can be can be doing fine actually so he played rook d1 um, removing the pin and i went with e5 which is the most logical move and uh, yeah if you're a grunfeld player now you're quite happy um, maybe there is still a way to keep the game in a slightly better shape than what he did so he now started exchanging pieces which might not be the best idea so takes 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 mm, 
and play the move e4. And yeah, so at this point it looks like, okay, the player settled a little bit. I have this strong bishop on g7. Um, he at some point might come with uh, f4 e5, but it's tricky to prepare that. And the question is a little bit who takes over the, the d-file. Um, and it's always, usually in these positions good to keep the tension and not to be the person who exchanges, because in this way by exchanging you usually just uh, lose a tempo. So instead of doing that, I went back bishop e6, and I thought, yeah, in such positions, maybe I can dream of attacking someday like this. Um, and I was honestly expecting a move like h3, which I think is what he should have done here. Um, so at least he now blocks uh, queen h5. Maybe now I can think about taking on d1, because at least it's a bit awkward to take back with the queen. Um, but the black advantage, I mean, there's this 3 versus 2 here versus this 4 versus 3, but the black advantage is very, very small, that's for sure. Instead, he went with a move bishop f4, which is much more active and in that way more natural, but allows me to get a lot of play against this king. So at least from a human perspective, I don't think that's the right approach. And yeah, here he now really went um, astray, so he decided to take and to now kick away my rook. So this move bishop c7 looks extremely unnatural to me. And when I saw this, I was immediately in punishing mode. Um, so, yeah, uh, tacked and I went for the move rook d7 and bishop to b8 attacking this pawn. So this looked extremely strange to me to go after such a not so really important pawn in a very concrete position. So maybe here you can pause the video and you can think about what black can do um, to get a better position. Well, so maybe you found the solution. I now saw this move knight to g4 and I was just way too tempted to play this. Um, and I think it's even objectively quite good. So of course I'm just attacking this pawn on, um, on h2. But my idea after h3 was to just take this guy on f2. So very, very nice uh, sacrifice. Felt very good in the first round uh, to play this move. Um, yeah, the obvious point is that he can't take back with the queen because of bishop d4. And um, so he basically, unless he wants to lose the piece, I mean, something like g4, for instance, always runs into queen c5. And the, yeah, the pin on, on uh, for instance, in such a line is still deadly. So he can't do that. So unless he just wants to give up the pawn and get completely crushed, he has to take back with the king. And I played the move queen to c5 check. And in my calculation, when I um, played the move rook to d7, I had actually seen this position. And I thought he has just one possible move here, namely the move king to f3. And this is indeed correct. Uh, in the game, he now blundered. But uh, yeah, he should play the move king to f3. Um, so what's the point of king f3? Well, the main point is not to run into bishop c4 check. Um, and yeah, the king is of course very exposed and I thought this position should somehow be winning for black. And my calculation during the game was, okay, he is already very low on time, so I will probably just go f5 immediately and then it's super awkward for him to uh, deal with the king. And indeed f5 is quite a, quite a decent move. So. Um, the computer still finds a very tenacious defense for white, goes bishop f1, takes, um, and now king to g2, and then yeah, it gives some crazy line like this, bishop d5 check, and now gives back the, the exchange, and evaluates this position as slightly better for black. I have to say, to me, it still looks really, really good for black, um, but yeah, so uh, it's clear that after f5, like finding this bishop f1 is already not so easy. And um, yeah, just from a human point of view, white is very, very close to, to being busted. Uh, also, instead of the move f5, which I played, the computer gives this move, bishop to h6, preparing a checkmate on e3, uh, with the idea to meet bishop f4 with g5. Uh, g5. Of course, idea is bishop e3, g4. And um, yeah, then if he plays something passive, 
just continues the attack in a slow way and uh, says this is completely winning for black. Um, but yeah, in any case, after king f3, I think both bishop h6 and f5 are from a human point. Um, very, very dangerous for white. Instead, after queen c5, as I said before, he blundered and he played the move a king to f1, being very short on time. Um, I think he probably relied on um, bishop c4, knight e2. But the problem here for him is maybe you can pause the video and you can find the, the best move. Well, the problem is that I can just take this guy first. And now bishop c4 comes and is completely unstoppable. So no matter how he takes, either with a queen or with a pawn, I can just go bishop c4 and that's a checkmate. So after bishop c3, he cannot really do anything anymore um, in the game. He still tried to move bishop to f3, but yeah, this just runs into rook to d2 and it's a checkmate. So um, yeah, that was the first game. We also won this match against Cambridge. And uh, yeah, in the end, the tournament uh, first went quite well for us, but then in the middle, we played against many of the strong teams and some of the matches were close and yeah, in the end went against us. I scored four out of five, which was quite decent, given that I played against two players above 24 and uh, two more players above 22. So um, decent tournament for me, definitely. And uh, yeah, great, great, great experience. Um, congratulations uh, to the team from Eindhoven, which won the tournament. And um, yeah, one more time, really thanks a lot for the organizers. Um, also the prize giving in the end was great. I mean, there was a message from one of the sons of Ennio Morricone and um, somebody from the football club from Bologna, which now plays in the Champions League, was involved, was there. And yeah, it was just a completely memorable um, experience for me. And I also think uh, for the other players in my team. And yeah, also once more, thanks to the other players from the team. This was fantastic. Thanks a lot for watching and see you next time.